This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Stick around to the end of the video for a special offer they're making available through my channel. Gamers, hello and welcome to another exciting edition of This Week in Video Games, the show that is proudly covering the news one week later than everybody else. It's been a quiet week this week on the news front, which means that in the time between when I finalize this video and when it goes live, some gigantic news is sure to have broken, like Tencent buys everything. All of the studios are now property of Tencent. Or Android Wilson experiences rare live malfunction during earnings call, necessitating emergency battery change. That'll be some good footage. I'd like to watch that. I don't know what I might have missed this week, but I tell you what I haven't missed. More Square Enix Sony rumors, a leak for a new Tomb Raider game, and Blizzard cancelling a secret MMO project. Those are some juicy stories, right? Want to hear about them? Well, stick around, because here comes the news. All right, let's start with that Ubisoft Tencent news. Last week in the Friends Per Second podcast, I said this. I really, really believe that Mike, that Ubisoft are going to try and find a buyer. There had already been rumors that they were like getting their house in order for that. But I think with these announcements, how bad all of this has been going for them, I would be stunned if no one swoops in and buys them in the next 12 to 18 months because mm. this is a pretty bad state of affairs and I think management are not the right people to lead them out of it and I don't think they want to just step off I think they'd rather cash out and move on so that's my personal prediction and would you know it earlier this week Reuters reported that Tencent were all up in Ubisoft's business and were definitely keen to gobble up a whole bunch more of it just to be clear Tencent isn't looking to purchase the entirety of the company they're just looking to up their stake in it Tencent bought a 5% stake in Ubisoft back in 2018 and have been sitting on it since then Reuters claimed to have four sources with knowledge of the deal who say that Tencent have reached out to the founding Gilmore family to express interest in increasing that stake. That family owns 15% of Ubisoft, which is valued at only $5.3 billion. Now, I know that sounds like a lot of money, but don't forget that Sony just bought Bungie, one studio, for $3.6 billion. Ubisoft has 20,000 employees across 45 studios. Bungie has roughly 1,000 employees in one studio. So $5.3 billion is actually pretty cheap in one sense, but it's also very expensive from an overhead and ongoing cost perspective. And see, this is my theory with all this, right? And it's just a theory, but here's what I think. Ubisoft is too fat for investors now. They're all scared off by that huge overhead, which I think Ubisoft themselves are kind of slave to at the moment. I think there's a reason they're so risk averse and trend chasing. They have to go with safe bets because keeping the lights on over 20,000 people's heads isn't easy. Tencent could buy Ubisoft with the change they find under their sofa, so them wanting to up their stake is probably a strategic play to better position them if and when the time comes to fend off other buyers, or if Ubisoft becomes financially distressed and has to sell at a song. As I've said earlier, I don't believe that Eve Gilmore plans to lead his company through a grand turnaround journey, and to be frank, he's not the right person to do that. My hope is that when everything goes down, and it will at some point, that those 20,000 people get to keep their jobs either through an intact Ubisoft purchase outright or through individual studios finding better homes with other publishers interested in making great games. Just briefly while we're on the topic of Ubisoft, few games better typify their challenges in portfolio management than Beyond Good and Evil 2, a game that has been in development for 15 years technically speaking. Even generously, it was 5 years ago that the cinematic reveal was shown off at E3 2017 and the game is still absolutely nowhere near released, to the point where many, myself included, have wondered aloud if this thing had actually been canned. Recent reporting by Tom Henderson seems to indicate that that wasn't the case, with the game apparently entering playtesting behind closed doors. Another life sign just showed up this week. The game just got a new lead writer. Sarah Arellano has previously written for World of Warcraft, and she took to Twitter this week to announce that she was the new lead writer for Beyond Good and Evil 2. So clearly the game is still alive, but the timing of appointing a new lead writer is a little odd. I mean, writing staff will very often step off a project before it launches, since the bulk of the writing is done when a game enters its final development, testing, and polishing phase. So it's weird that they're appointing a new lead writer now, five years into development, right? Perhaps it's to do with future content, since Beyond Good and Evil 2 is being positioned as a platform that will likely get future DLC and content similar to current Assassin's Creed games. Either way, we don't know because we have absolutely no idea what's going on with this video game because Ubisoft refused to tell us, so speculation is all we have. 
I do hope the Beyond Good and Evil 2 does one day make an appearance because I love the first one, but I'm certainly not expecting that to happen anytime soon. Coming back to that acquisition meta that the video game industry currently finds itself in, it isn't just Ubisoft in the crosshairs. Square Enix is desperate to put itself up for auction, and it's doling itself up like Cloud at the Honeybee Inn as it searches for a willing suitor. This story comes from games industry analyst David Gibson, who was reporting on Square Enix's latest earnings call. Square Enix said that they see the recent sale of Crystal Dynamics and Eidos Montreal as phase one of its changes to the business. Spoiler alert, most plans from mega corporations that have a phase one generally don't end well for anyone whose name doesn't end in shareholder. Phase two of this plan involves Square Enix reviewing its portfolio of studios to see which ones it would like to fully own and which studios it would allow investors to buy a stake in. They're not looking to sell any of these studios, but they are open to welcoming investment in them. Apparently, the goal is more agility, giving Square more resources it can move around to focus more on its Japanese titles. One crucial tidbit was the reasoning for the sale of its Western operations. We suspected that this was due to resource drain imposed by those studios, since Square Enix clearly didn't know how to properly manage them, and that was correct, with Square Enix themselves saying that these studios cannibalized from the rest of the group, making it harder to allocate resources elsewhere. This is a bummer to hear, because it's yet another example of Square throwing shade at studios that they themselves mismanaged, either through poor project allocation or poor marketing support. The subtext to all of this, as well as the rumors that continue to swirl, is that Square Enix are looking to make themselves a nice, lean target for acquisition. It's hard to imagine that Sony wouldn't be interested in something like that, given how many valuable IPs Square Enix sits on, but it does seem like Square has got a little more house cleaning to do before a deal like that might materialize. Square Enix are currently in the process of selling off the Tomb Raider franchise for a laughably low price to embrace a group, but while they still own it, they're issuing DMCA takedowns to stop details about a potential sequel from getting out. This week, Colin Moriarty of the Sacred Symbols podcast got a hold of the script that is currently being circulated to recruit voice actor talent to the project. Apparently, they're seeking a mid-30s actress for the gig, implying that Lara will be a little older in this outing. The primer also indicated that Lara would be famous at this point, having inspired an entire generation of Tomb Raiders. The Sacred Symbols crew actually did a live reading of the script excerpt, and one of the details that came out of it was that Lara may be involved in an intimate relationship with another woman. A first for the character in-game, but certainly not a first for Lara Croft fan artists. While it's always natural to be skeptical of leaks, you can be a lot less skeptical about them when the company Companies involved issue DMCA takedowns to try and plug them. That's what happened when Sacred Symbols was issued a DMCA request by Patreon on behalf of Square Enix. Sacred Symbols did comply with that request on Patreon, but they have left the YouTube video up, which has the segment still included. If you'd like to check that one out, you'll find a link to it below the like button. Last week, we talked about the fact that Activision Blizzard had a pretty rough year, losing around a third of their monthly active users since early 2021. This week, it copped another blow with the cancellation of a World of Warcraft mobile spin off that was apparently in development for three years. This report comes from Bloomberg, who say that the title was a mobile MMORPG. It wasn't a port of WoW, but rather a spin-off set during a different time period. So that's actually kind of cool, and I'd be interested in something like that, except for the fact that it would have been a mobile game made by Blizzard and NetEase, and we know exactly how those go. There's no way this wouldn't have been some horribly mutilated abomination of the Warcraft franchise, cynically monetizing every facet of it, so it was interesting Interesting as this premise was, I'm not particularly disappointed to see this project get ethered. Despite three years of work and over 100 developers allocated to the project, the deal apparently fell over because the two companies couldn't agree to commercial terms. Two multi-billion dollar entities who have chosen to cut the baby in half rather than save it. This does call into question Blizzard's ongoing relationship with NetEase, who are Blizzard's ticket into the lucrative Chinese market. And with future mobile projects planned, this will certainly be a dynamic to keep an eye on. One other company getting into bed with NetEase is Bungie, who recently have been confronting the impact of toxicity and harassment head on. Some weeks back, Bungie confirmed that they were scaling back some of their direct engagement with the community, owing to threats and harassment from the community. Bungie community manager DMG took to Reddit to say, quote, The harassment we've spoken about isn't just rude replies on Twitter or vague comments. There have been real threats towards our people and our studio. We're taking them seriously, which is leading to an amount of reduced communications as the team plans future protections strategies to help avoid these sorts of things, end quote. We knew about some of these instances of harassment already. Bungie recently brought suit against one streamer who was threatening to burn down Bungie HQ and who suggested that one Bungie staff member wasn't safe after that streamer recently moved into that staff member's neighborhood. This week, more details emerged and they are very grim and they do highlight just how real these threats have become. 
After Bungie posted an ad campaign centered on an African-American community member who goes by the name of Amaze. His link is below, by the way. This guy freestyle raps when he's playing Destiny. It's very fucking cool. Please go check it out. Give him some love. Anyway, after Bungie posted that ad campaign, some of their staff members started receiving extremely racist and extremely threatening phone calls and messages to their private unlisted phone numbers. This person also ordered pizza directly to these staff members' houses, meaning that they had their home address. Bungie intervened to support the affected employees, getting a court order for the phone carrier to reveal the identity of the person who sent those texts. That's all we know for now, but I genuinely hope that Bungie's lawyers and local law enforcement are bringing the hammer down hard because no one should live in fear, least of all video game developers who tweet out a video of someone rapping about Destiny. That is insanity, but sadly, it's the reality that Bungie staff are living through right now, and Bungie have said they'll continue to scale back community engagement until they can develop new approaches and safety mechanisms to protect their people, and that sounds more than fair to me. Okay, that block was a bummer, so here comes some good news. One feature we've all been asking for is a family option for Game Pass, allowing us to share the benefits of our membership with those closest to us, or those mates fortunate enough to be able to leech off our membership. Uncle Phil was listening, and right now, in both Ireland and Colombia, Xbox are running a beta test on a new family option that lets you add up to four other people to your Game Pass Ultimate subscription, with each of them having their own Game Pass profile, tracking stuff like games you've tagged to play later on, etc. It's more expensive than a base Ultimate subscription, coming in at 22 euros for the month, meaning it'll probably be around 25 US dollars a month when it lands stateside. So if you have five people on that subscription, that's essentially five bucks a pop for Game Pass Ultimate, which is a very good deal. At this time, it's unclear what sort of restrictions Microsoft might impose a la Netflix who've added some bullshit like you need to be in the same house and in the same room and submit your fucking marriage certificate for this to work. But hopefully this is just a straight up perk that lets us use this however we please. That'd be great. Speaking of Xbox, we learned a little bit more about the troubled development of Halo Infinite this week. 343 Industries head of creative and Bungie alumnus Joe Staten was speaking on the Game Makers Notebook podcast this week. And in that conversation, he says that Zeta Halo, the open world that plays host to most of the game's campaign was significantly scaled back during development as the team didn't have enough time to realize their full vision. Quote, we didn't end up cutting that much ultimately from the open world, but I know the original design, there was a pretty significant scaling back of what the team had hoped at one point they could deliver on, end quote. This aligns with earlier reporting from Bloomberg, who said that huge chunks of the open world were cut during development, owing mainly to production issues. That is concerning, not only because 343 had six years to develop Halo Infinite, one of those years being the result of a very famous delay, but Zeta Halo didn't end up being all that great. It's a pretty basic, dare I say, empty sandbox that really pales in comparison to pretty much every contemporary AAA open world. This coupled with the lack of multiplayer content and the slow delivery cadence post-launch, these sorts of statements really do continue to put the magnifying glass on 343's stewardship of this franchise. I think that 343 absolutely nailed Halo's core gameplay loop in Infinite, but I think it's pretty clear that if they're going to carry Halo forward, they're going to need some significant support, ideally from some of those studios Microsoft is about to acquire as part of that Activision Blizzard deal. Here's a funny headline. EA says single player games are really good and important now, actually. It's funny because this is the publisher who years earlier had essentially sworn off single player games, pivoting their entire business to live services propped up by loot boxes and gambling. I mean, we had a live service Dragon Age on the way, but thankfully that idea got nixed. We had Anthem, and I don't think I need to tell you guys how that went down. We had Project Ragtag, that Star Wars game that got canned because it didn't have some version of Ultimate Team crudely smushed into it to make a billion dollars. So yeah, EA is very on the record as being pretty anti-single player games, at least up until recently. The last little while, EA has found success with a number of single player titles. Jedi Fallen Order was excellent, as was Star Wars Squadrons from EA Motive. It Takes Two was phenomenal, to the point where it got a Game of the Year nod last year at the Game Awards. Awards. EA have taken note of the success, greenlighting additional single player games like a Black Panther game and a new Jedi Fallen Order game, as well as some unannounced titles. Proto Patrick Bateman and EA CEO Andy Wilson gave voice to the strategic pivot during a recent earnings call. Speaking on the different motivations that players have, he said, quote, And as we think about single player games, we think it's a really, really important part of the overall portfolio that we deliver in the fulfillment of those core motivations. And the way we plan for it over time is really just looking at our community and looking at how they're spending their time and looking at where motivations may or may not be fulfilled. And we'll look to supplement that with the addition of new online games, new 
multiplayer games and new single player games, end quote. His CFO did then go on to clarify that live services will continue to be the rock EA's church is built on, accounting for over 70% of their annual revenue. But given that EA have been putting out some great single player stuff in the last little while, I'm low key happy to hear them publicly committing to continue that investment. Hey, what about some quick no fucking thanks news? You guys might've heard that GameStop opened their own NFT marketplace and it's going just about as well as every other NFT scam running right now. A few weeks back, GameStop were hosting the sale of an image relating to the 9-11 attack that was quickly removed and an apology issued. This week, GameStop have graduated from bad taste to outright theft as their platform is now facilitating piracy of indie titles. The details are annoying to explain because it's very dependent on NFT blockchain complexity that exists for complexity's sake alone. But essentially, one dude took some games that were available on other platforms, he minted them as NFTs, and then sold them for a few thousand dollars on GameStop's platform. He did not create these games, he did not seek permission to use these in any way, and he certainly did not look to compensate the creators in any way. GameStop have since removed these listed items and banned this dude from their platform. But the funny thing about the blockchain is that once it's on there, you can't get it off. And right now, it's still possible to utilize the platform that GameStop built to play these stolen video games. GameStop storefront has only been live for a few weeks, but it's already generated two major scandals. So I'm sure the future of the no fucking thanks segment is very bright indeed, so long as GameStop stays this course. Let's do a quick lightning round to finish off. Little known up and comer and poison swamp enthusiast Hidetaka Miyazaki is being honored with a Games Industry Achievement Award at the next Computer Entertainment Developers Conference. Previous award winners include Ken Kutaragi, father of the PlayStation, Hinorobi Sakaguchi, creator of Final Fantasy, and Shigeru Miyamoto, creator of that quote about games getting delayed. Speaking of Elden Ring, YouTube put out some figures to show off just how much that game took over YouTube in the first 60 days since its launch. Elden Ring generated 3.4 billion views on YouTube in that time, absolutely dwarfing its nearest competitor, GTA V, which garnered 1.9 billion views in its first 60 days. While this is impressive for Elden Ring, you gotta remember that YouTube was a hell of a lot smaller when GTA V launched back in 2013, so you really gotta wonder how big those numbers are gonna be when GTA 6 finally arrives. And finally, the Steam Deck is shipping to more territories. If you're living in Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, or Hong Kong, you can now get your hands on Gabe's big deck by ordering one through Komodo, who are Valve's distribution partner in Asia. When asked if Australia might be receiving Steam Decks anytime soon, Gabe responded with, yeah, nah. He didn't really say that, but I'm sure he's thinking it. So what got announced or delayed this week? Well, the big one is admittedly not one that I'm super close to, but a bunch of people lost their shit at this. Tactics Ogre Reborn. Now, I never played it, but it was a game originally released back on the SNES and then re-released back in 2011 for the PSP. Those who did play it say it's one of the best tactics games ever made and straight up one of the best JRPGs of all time. This new remaster is based on the 2011 release and it has full voice acting for all characters, overhauled visuals, improvements to enemy AI, and an overhauling of the class system. Funnily enough, this one was leaked last month by Sony themselves. Oops. It's official now, and Tactics Ogre Reborn will hit all platforms on November 11th. Back for Blood certainly hasn't found the cut through and longevity that it had hoped for when it launched earlier this year. Regardless, Turtle Rock are forging ahead with the second major expansion for the game titled Children of the Worm. This one adds a new act to the main campaign, some new weapons, new enemies, and a new cleaner to clean things, I guess. This is paid DLC, either on its own or as part of the season pass, and it'll be available on August 30th. Speaking of DLC, The Ascent is getting some. It's called Cyber Heist, and details are a little light on, but it does appear to be adding new missions, new playable spaces, and new weapons, including melee. There's a big ass sword that's shown off in the trailer, which looks kind of fun. The Ascent didn't get universal praise back at launch, but I really like this one. I thought it was a really straightforward but well-made co-op twin-stick shooter with one of the sickest cyberpunk cities since Night City. If you want to check out the base game, it is on Game Pass, and if you're keen on the DLC, that'll hit on August 18th. Hey, this looks cool. Meet, meet your maker, the next big thing from Dead by Daylight developer Behaviour Interactive. While they continue to support Dead by Daylight, and they recently released a dating simulator, okay, they also found the time to spin up this bad boy, which appears to combine Mario Maker with a first-person perspective and some PvP sprinkled in there, all wrapped up in a rage aesthetic. There's a lot of brown up in here. Still, it does look interesting. I can't think of a game that's combined these elements in this way since the competitive PvP twist is sure to create a lot of pressure both on the design side and the survive side. The game will support different loadouts, allowing you to conquer these player-designed citadels in a variety of ways. 
And yeah, it just looks cool. I'm super interested in this. And if you are too, then you can sign up for the beta tests over on Behavior Interactive's website. Crypt of the Necrodancer really seems to have kicked things off a few years back. A whole sub-genre of rhythm-based dungeon crawlers and first-person shooters. After a long hiatus, Necrodancer is back with a new DLC release titled Synchrony. It's a very meaty update that adds three new characters, mod support, new items and enemies, and online multiplayer. That is available right now in early access, so grab that if you're keen. At the end of the trailer announcement, the studio revealed that they are working on the next entry in the Necrodancer franchise. It's a new standalone game titled Rift of the Necrodancer. No word yet on when this is coming, but it's on the way. Two delay announcements this week. The first is for Multiverses, who themselves seem a little stunned at just how massive their launch has been. They took to Twitter to say a big thank you to everyone, but also announced that they were delaying the start of Season 1 and the release of the Morty character to a later date. They do not provide that date, they just said later. And finally, Gloomwood has been delayed a few weeks and will now launch September 6th. This one is looking awesome. It's published by New Blood, the team behind stuff like Dusk, a medieval, Ultra Kill, and it's essentially a spiritual successor to the old Thief games. I played this during a Steam Next Fest a while back and loved every second of it, from its creepy aesthetic to its flexible and responsive immersive sim sandbox. We don't get many immersive sims these days as AAA seems to have all but given up on them. So it's nice to see indies carrying that torch Literally, in the case of Gloomwood. So what came out last week? Uh, yeah, not, uh, not much. Like I said, it was a very lean offering indeed, but what little did land, landed pretty well. First up is South of the Circle, which is a thoughtful, feelsy, narrative-led experience with some brilliant art design. Word is that the gameplay side of things is pretty weak, but that it more than makes up for it with strong writing. Steam reviews have this at around 85% very positive, while Open Critic put this at a strong 76%. Paste Magazine scored this a 7.5, saying, quote, It might be light on traditional gameplay, but it knows what it wants to say and stays focused on that throughout, end quote. While the six axes were largely of the same mind, scoring it a 7 and saying, quote, The engaging and multi-layered story kept me engaged and definitely helped me forget I wasn't actually doing much playing, end quote. The other release this week was Turbo Golf Racing, the game that asks, What if Rocket League, but golf? Not exactly the most original variation on the popular formula, but hey, soccer with cars is fun, so surely golf with cars will be fun too, right? Evidently, yes, though it is still early days. Steam reviews at the time of writing had this at a very positive 92%. No critic reviews yet, as I guess critics are still backed up playing Xenoblade 3 or something. Regardless, Turbo Golf Racing isn't shooting for much, but it looks like it's coming in under par, which sounds bad as a colloquialism, but it's actually a good thing in the world of golf. So we really need to stop misusing that one, I think. Anyway, this is out on Game Pass, so if you want to check it out on the cheap, that's the best way to do it. So what's coming out this week? Pretty big week, not gonna lie. And to kick things off is Two Point Campus, arriving on all platforms on the 9th. The Two Point franchise is now two games long, the first being in a hospital setting, and now it turns to college education. If you haven't heard of Two Point before, then you may have heard of some of the games that these devs had previously worked on at other studios, stuff like Theme Hospital, Black and White, and Fable. It's a coming together of industry veterans serving a niche but beloved sub-genre of folksy management games. If you're keen to check out Two Point Campus, then good news, this one is on Game Pass Day 1. A price point so good, even an impoverished college student could afford it. Lost in Play is a charming looking adventure game that tells the story of two siblings lost in a dreamscape. They have to explore the vastness of their own subconscious while solving puzzles to get through it all. Really awesome art and animation on display here. Definitely one to check out if you're into your adventure games. It's out on the 10th for PC and Switch. Okay, this next one is weird, but also simultaneously awesome. Imagine working at a laundromat and hating your job so much that you slowly, surreptitiously transform the place into a video game arcade. That is the conceit propping up Arcade Paradise, which arrives on all platforms on the 11th. You literally do laundry stuff like an episode of Seinfeld or Friends, and then when the day is done, you go into the back and play arcade games and invest all your laundromat quarters into buying more arcade cabinets. This looks pretty jank, but I don't care. There's nothing about this package I don't love, and I'm definitely booting this up at some point this week. All right, we're getting to the big hitters now. First up is Rumbleverse, which arrives on all platforms on the 11th. Do note that it is exclusive to the Epic Games Store for PC. Now, I know we're all tired of Battle Royale games. Ubisoft sure learned that the hard way recently, but hear me out. What if you took the high stakes competitive tension of Battle Royale and combined it with the mask wearing spandex laced aerial acrobatics of wrestling, the world's most brutal and totally real sport? 
That's Rumbleverse. 40 people enter, one team emerges champion. It's all about massive pile drives and suplexes and jackknife power bombs. I mean, those terms are so awesome that they feel tailor made for video games. Rumbleverse is free to play, and I can tell you right now that it has been getting a lot of positive buzz during its beta tests. So if you're all keen, I'd grab some mates and check it out. Cult of the Lamb arrives on all platforms on the 11th. I have played and finished this one ahead of a review I'll do later this week. So I can't say much as I'm under embargo, but I will say this. You can enslave innocent looking animal creatures and then force them to eat bowls of their own poop. If that interests you, then there's something really wrong with you, but um, that's okay. You're gonna like this video game. And finally, Marvel Spider-Man Remastered arrives for PC on the 12th. I feel like the success of Spider-Man PS4 was so total and so ubiquitous that it's hard to imagine that anyone hasn't played this game yet. But of course, there are plenty of people who do not have a PlayStation and have not yet had the chance to experience the finest superhero video game since Arkham, and arguably one of the greatest action games of all time. Spider-Man fuses a brilliantly written and performed story with some incredible MCU-level spectacle with some absolutely fantastic combat and web-slinging to deliver the defining Spider-Man Spider-Man fantasy, not a small feat, given how good those Activision Spider games were back in the day. The remaster includes a bunch of graphical enhancements and the story DLC titled The City That Never Sleeps. The PC version is packed full of PC graphical options, Nvidia DLSS, ultra-wide support, and support for DualSense features so long as you have your DualSense plugged in. This is going to be pretty damn great both for first-timers and as an excuse to take another swing through the Big Apple. That's certainly what I'll be doing later this week. Put this on your radar. Fall hit my inbox a little while ago and I'd never heard of it, but I decided to take a look because it's a really interesting mashup of genres. So at its most basic level, Spiritfall is a dungeon crawling roguelike where you progress through a procedurally generated map similar to something like Slay the Spire, each node offering different rewards for completing it. The progression is also quite roguelike in the sense that you get randomized upgrade cards that augment your build, similar to something like Hades. The core gameplay though is where it gets interesting because it's actually modeled on platform fighters like Smash Bros. Brothers. Each level you zone into is a multi-tiered fighting stage and you beat up some PvE enemies and combat's very focused on combos and dashes and knockups. So that's Slay the Spire meets Hades meets Smash Brothers. Plus it has a great art style. The more I checked this out, the more interested I became. And so this is definitely on my radar. If you'd like to put it on yours, then the best way to do that is to wishlist it on Steam. I'll leave a link to that over on my Steam curator page, which also features links to all of the other put this on your radar stuff I've profiled. You'll find a link to all of that below the like button. Sort of free stuff time now. And first cab off the rank is Epic, who right now are giving away the excellent looking Unrailed. I didn't even know this existed until last week, but now I very much want to find the time to play it because it looks super cool. Grab that quick though, because on the 12th, it'll click over to cook, serve, delicious. That rising intonation there was the question mark at the end of the title, not my editorializing. It's a cooking game where you have to tour the United States in a food truck, making your favorite dishes while getting shot at by rival food trucks, apparently. America, man, not even the sacred food truck is safe. Okay, so this month's Game Pass lineup is copying a little flack. A lot of people are calling it mid-pass. I mean, it's not the best month we've ever had, but I think it's pretty good, especially given the range of genres that are covered off here. I mean, we have a cooking sim, since sims seem to be all the rage right now. Ghost Recon Wildlands is in there if you're into your open world checklist-a-thons. Two Point Campus is that management sim I mentioned earlier. That's day one on Game Pass. Same deal with Turbo Golf Racing, day one. For the more strategy inclined, we have the very solid Rome Expeditions. If capitalism is your jam, then you're sure to enjoy Offworld Trading Company. And if you want to be a hacker or something, then Shenzhen IO will teach you how to do that, I think. I don't really know. This looks very weird. Two other quick things to shout out this month. The first is that to celebrate the Evo Fighting Tournament, which just wrapped up over the weekend, Capcom are doing a free-to-play Street Fighter V thing. The game plus every character is unlocked, totally free-to-play play until August 17th. This is for PS4 only, no other strings attached. And finally, Humble Bundle. I don't usually shout this one out, but this month is a good one. The August bundle contains bangers like The Ascent, Hot Wheels Unleashed, great game, A Plague Tale Innocence, fantastic game, and a smattering of other titles. You can get all of that for as little as I think around 13 US dollars ish. So yeah, it's a great deal available through Humble for the entire month of August. Our feel good story for the week comes courtesy of Keanu Lookalike and Internet Jesus, Charlie, AKA Moist Critical. Charlie, a Halo fan himself, recently issued a bounty for a challenge that was hitherto deemed beyond the reach of mere mortals. Play through all of Halo 2 on legendary difficulty with all skulls enabled without dying once. 
That is literally a legendary challenge in the Halo community to the point where everyone's pretty certain that no one's done it before. If you don't know, skulls are modifiers that make the game harder by giving enemies more health, more damage, faster reload, and all sorts of other bullshit. It's not uncommon to be unfairly insta gibbed at any moment during a legendary run, and the thought of adding all skulls at once plus not being able to die in a single run? That sounds truly awful. Fuck that. But I am soft, unlike Twitch streamer Javalin, who is hard like iron. He live streamed a run on August 3rd that did ultimately culminate in him clearing the run in seven hours, legendary difficulty, all skulls enabled, zero deaths, and $20,000 richer thanks to Charlie's bounty. His family were a little bit excited when it all went down. We did it! We did it! <laughs> <laughs> some wholesome shit right there and a great way to finish the episode guys this is a big week for the channel coming up later this week i've got a review for spider-man on pc just in case you're wondering how that pc port is shaping up i'm also doing call to the lamp plus another edition of the friends per second podcast featuring special guest Jeff Keighley, the Game Awards boss himself, will talk through what to look forward to at Gamescom this year, the future of E3, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Huge week ahead, so if you want to be here for all of it, then be sure to hit that subscribe button and dig the notification bell. If you had a good time here today, then a like on the video is always appreciated. It does make a big difference. Thank you very much for stopping by. I'll see you soon. Shill up out. If you've been around these parts before, you've probably heard me talk about Squarespace once or twice, maybe. No, but seriously, Squarespace has been supporting this channel for around two years now. They are, in fact, my longest running partner, and I really do thank them for that. I've always loved having them as a partner because they put out a great product that I am more than happy to recommend to you. If you haven't heard of them, Squarespace is a platform that allows you to easily create custom-built websites that look professional. So if you're starting a business or you want to promote your art or you want to start a blog or whatever, then Squarespace is the perfect place to do just that. You just select a template, customize it in minutes, enable whatever features Features take your fancy like e-commerce or calendars or a comment section or whatever you like and then you can publish it. There are of course detailed analytics allowing you to see how your website is tracking so you can see you know what people are clicking on and how the website is doing which is of course very important. To get started visit squarespace.com and when you're ready to get serious visit squarespace.com forward slash skill up for a 10% discount on your first purchase of a website or a domain name. Thanks Squarespace for sponsoring the video and thank you for watching it.